Hello and welcome to the My Heritage webinar series. I'm Jeff Rasmussen, your host, broadcasting to you live from webinar headquarters in Middleton, Idaho. Today we have Mike Mansfield with us for the topic of Have Nordic Ancestors? Count Yourself Lucky? Nordic Records Are Amazing. Thanks to Mike and thanks to all of you, more than 1,300 of you from 25 countries around the world, including the countries of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, have registered for today's live webinar. So wherever and whenever you are, thanks for sharing part of your day with us. My personal ethnicity results from my Heritage DNA show that I'm 44.8% Scandinavian, so I'm also very enthusiastic about learning from Mike today. And speaking of Mike, let's give him a proper introduction now. Mike Mansfield is Director of Content Operations at MyHeritage since 2013. In this role, he is responsible for defining the company's strategy for growing its collection of 8.4 billion historical records and supervising all operations of content acquisition. Previously, Mike held a Senior Product Manager role at FamilySearch. His professional career has been heavily focused in electronic publishing, search and retrieval, and content acquisition and strategy. After completing his B.S. in Computer Science at Brigham Young University in 1994, he worked for Folio Corporation, a Provo, Utah-based technology company which developed cutting-edge CD-ROM publication and search technology. Mike joined Ancestry in 1999 and held key roles in its development of the search engine and publication platform still in use today. As the senior director of search and content, he led the team that created the record hinting system, which helped to revolutionize the way in which users interact with online genealogical records. Mike continued to develop his expertise in his roles in Family Search and My Heritage. Please put together your virtual hands and let's give Mike Mansfield a nice warm webinar. Welcome. Uh, Mike, how are you and welcome to the show. Good. Thank you. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah, you sound great, Mike. Awesome. We're projecting good. And it looks great. You bet. Awesome. Okay, the time's all yours, Mike. Well, great. Thank you. Yeah, it's certainly exciting to be with you. Uh, like Jeff, I also have quite a bit of Scandinavian and uh, Nordic ancestry. I'm lucky enough to have two separate branches from uh, the countries of both of uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. None from Finland, darn it. So I, I miss out on doing some personal Finnish research, but there are also just amazing records there in Finland. Let's go ahead and get started. Just quickly, an overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'll just provide a really quick introduction to some Scandinavian and Nordic uh, geography and some patronymics naming customs. We'll look just briefly at some immigration uh, issues. And I'll also highlight two important tools that I found very helpful uh, dealing with these uh, websites, some of which I'll be showing today, which are not always well translated into English. And then we'll spend most of the time going over country-specific resources, and we'll go in the order of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So sometimes you, you hear the, the distinction or you get the question, you know, what's the difference between Scandinavian and Nordic? Technically, Scandinavia is Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, colored in sort of a darker red here on the map of the right. If we go a little bit broader and we pick up Finland and Iceland, then we're technically in the Nordic countries. And you can also include some of the possessions of some of these countries, such as Greenland. Well, it's now an independent country and the Faroe Islands, which is sort of a province uh, of Denmark. And then way up to the north, there's this uh, archipelago called the Svalbard Arch uh, Archipelago. No one really lives there. Uh, it is famous for having this large seed bank where they store uh, seeds at sub-zero uh, temperatures. And then this little uh, chain of islands between Sweden and Finland called Åland. Also, I, I apologize, I, I don't speak any of these languages. Uh, my language training mostly is in French, so I will probably tend to speak very improper uh, Scandinavian uh, terms and, and words and beg your forgiveness in advance. Let's look briefly at some vexology. This is a fun word. This is the study of flags. So, of course, we have Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland, all based on uh, on the Christian cross, and some of these smaller things that we've talked about, such as Oland, Faroe Islands. 
when Greenland uh, was granted independence in the 1970s, they started to work on a flag and they came up with these two ideas, but instead they went with that one. So uh, Greenland's a little bit different. Uh, next, I wanna look at just a little bit of patronymics. And I, again, I really like this term as well, anthroponymastics, the study of anthronyms, meaning the study of names we give to people. And so patronymics is a, is a branch of this larger uh, social science. So patronymics for Norway, and, and the patterns here you'll see will be very similar as we go through these countries fairly uh, quickly. But in Norway, if your grandfather's name was Kund, your father would have historically been taken his given name followed by Kund and then son. I think we're, many of us are familiar with these patterns. So Kund's son, the, the mother would be whatever uh, her father's name was followed by Datter. And then sons would take uh, the given name of the father and append on son, and daughters would append on daughters. So in Norway from 1875 to 1900, uh, patronymics began to be replaced with surnames. So it's certainly common during this time period to see your ancestor's surname change. Uh, perhaps they're adopting the surname of their father and they stopped uh, using the patronymic system. Unfortunately, there's no official registration of these name changes. And generally these uh, changes did happen in the cities and then migrated out to the more rural areas. Sweden, a very similar uh, type of practice. Again, just some minor differences in the spelling of, of the word son and S-O-N instead of S-E-N and daughter, D-O-T-T-E-R. Very similar uh, time frame in Sweden as in Norway by the late 1800s the practice started to end and fixed surnames became standard. Uh, Denmark looks very similar in spellings to uh, Finland, excuse me, to Norway with a S-E-N and a D-A-T-T-E-R. Uh, interestingly enough, Iceland, and I won't spend a lot of time on Iceland in this talk, but uh, patronymics are still in use in Iceland today. So if you ever see an Icelandic phone book, they're kind of fun to look at as you see uh, this patronymic pattern continuing. Briefly, some special notes about naming customs in Finland. So given names in Finland and Finnish society are often in both Swedish and Finnish. So it's common for people to have a Swedish form and a Finnish form. And historically, records may have used one form in one record and another form in another record. Uh, the culture there in Finland sort of uh, shifted from is more vogue to have a Swedish name and sort of a sign of, of a middle class person. And over time that changed where Finnish became more and more recognized as a, a standard national language and people have uh, started to use more and more their, their Finnish form. But it's important to understand if you do have Finnish ancestors that a, a Swedish form of a name can vary significantly from the Finnish counterpart. Here's some male names, for example, Anders, the Finnish form is Antti, and female names, a good example there is Birgitta and Perko. So you need to keep this in mind when you're doing Finnish genealogical research, is what form of uh, name was your ancestor using? Were they using their Swedish form or their Finnish form or both? And so here's some examples of what the patronymics would look like. So you might have a grandfather, again, this would be the same man, Gustav Matson, who could have also been known as Kusta Manapoika. Poika is the patronymic uh, form, uh, that's a Finnish form of the word son. And then on the female side, this uh, word I'm probably not gonna say right, but Tatar uh, is how you'd say daughter in Finnish. Uh, Really only by the early part of the 19th century, or the 1900s, excuse me, did families really uh, in Finland start to adopt fixed surnames. Uh, actually laws were passed to sort of uh, encode it and, and to move the society that way. This is just an example that I wanna point out and there's articles you're able to find online that would give you other information for these types of patterns based on what country you'll be, look, you'll be working in. But for example, in Denmark, it's common that a person or a, a couple, a man and a woman, might name their first daughter. The most common thing was to name her after her paternal grandmother. The second daughter would have been named after her maternal grandmother. 
the first son after the paternal grandfather and the second son after the paternal grandmother. Again, this wasn't an ironclad rule, and most of these societies have a similar sort of, of pattern. I'd encourage you to uh, seek out that information. It's helpful when you're looking at families. You can sometimes discover that you're missing a, a child in the family. Maybe they've moved out of the house. Uh, maybe they have passed away, and these patterns can help you fill in gaps. Just briefly, some information about Nordic immigration. And primarily here I'll be focusing on US and Canada as the target countries, but certainly many uh, people from the Nordic countries also went to Australia and New Zealand, uh, South Africa. Uh, really, they, they, they did spread out quite a bit uh, around the globe. Certainly North America, though, was, was a very favorite destination. Uh, this economic, well, economic pressure in these countries in the 1800s led to high unemployment. Uh, farmland became uh, scarce, especially farmland that was productive, and a burgeoning population uh, compounded these issues. In the U.S., the Homestead Act of 1862 was a particularly strong magnet for uh, these people in Scandinavia and Finland, where they could come to the United States and, over time, uh, under the Homestead Act, actually acquire a farm for very little money. So Norwegians favored Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Dakotas, and Western Canada. Uh, the Danes primarily settled in uh, the regions of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and Kansas. And then Swedes uh, really crossed the entire, uh, entire upper Midwest, and in Canada from Ontario to British Columbia. And the Finns built uh, new lives on farms and mills of the upper Midwest, and the mines of the West, and factories as well in the Northeast area. And we can kind of bookmark this immigration by the uh, this Immigration Act of 1924 that was a major reform in the U.S. immigration uh, policies. And much of the immigration that had happened in the past uh, 50 to 60 years certainly uh, diminished greatly from that Immigration Act. Really pushing other, you know, pushing people that did want to immigrate from these countries to Canada or other countries that were more open to accepting them. Uh, though certainly not as numerous as the German or the Irish immigrants, Nordic immigrants arrived in just incredible numbers. Uh, one estimate that I've seen is as high as 1.3 million Swedes. I have 1.2 million here. It's a little more conservative uh, estim uh, immigrated. This, again, this is just to North America. Uh, during the decade of the 1880s, more than 1% of the population of Sweden immigrated to the U.S. each year. So that's a significant uh, departure. And by the 1930s, approximately 20% of the entire Swedish population had left the country. That's just incredible. Uh, about 800,000 Norwegians. An interesting note about uh, Norwegian immigration is, with the exception of Ireland, no other country contributed more of its citizens to the United States than Norway. So we place, percentage-wise, Norway second, just behind Ireland. And then about 300,000 Danes and similar numbers of Finns. Two important tools I do want to quickly uh, point out that I find very helpful when I'm doing Nordic research is definitely you want to have a web browser that provides language translation. And I'll show some information about this in just a moment. And then another site I'll, I'll briefly touch on called Nordic Names. It's very helpful for looking at the names you have in your tree and your family and really deciphering uh, what they might have been uh, known in the uh, Scandinavian or Nordic countries. So by, by far my, my favorite tool here for doing web browser uh, translation on the fly is Google Chrome, and it has this built-in ability called Google Translate. I hope you've seen this before. I'm showing a, a web page here. This is the National Archives of Sweden website, Riksarvet, if I'm close to saying it correctly. And what Google Chrome will do by default, it will pop up this bar. It recognizes the site is in Swedish, and it would it's asking me if I'd like to translate it. I can go ahead and hit that translate button, and I get the site translated in English. Now, this is a machine translation. The translations aren't perfect. Oftentimes, there's some funny uh, errors that occur, but in general, you can get a very good idea of what the different options and pages are saying. Uh, also, with this Google plugin or this default behavior in Google Chrome, actually, I can uh, flip it back to the original very easily. A lot of these sites, uh, some of which I'll be showing today, uh, these National Archive sites, 
offer their website in other languages. So here at the National Archives of Sweden, they're showing that they offer it in uh, Sweden, English, Finnish, and that bottom one is the Swedish word for German. And these are helpful, but I've often found many pages where they don't offer a translation in these languages. So I think you'll still need this, uh, this ability. So for example, here's a page from the National Archives of, of Denmark. This has got a, a great listing page. It appears to be talking about some collections. And a common motif you'll see is this uh, flag uh, design in the upper corner that's an indicator that they might have an English language translation for you. So in this case, I'm gonna click on the Union Jack to indicate I want English. And all that it did is it changed some of the labels and headers. If you see the, the headers instead of Noven, it says name instead of uh, the Swedish word for read more, it's gonna uh, give me this read more about. So it's only partially translated. In this case, I'll still want to use this ability to translate this page and get an idea of what they're offering to me. So again, just a very handy uh, tool uh, for looking at these uh, websites that aren't natively in, the, in English. The next tool I, I quickly wanna show is the Nordic Names uh, site. This is a great website, uh, nordicnames.de. And what this does is it lets you put in uh, primarily given names. So here I'm gonna search for William, and it's gonna show me that William is a form of Wilhelm and give me information about the usage in these other countries. The reason why I, I find this important is at least in my family, I have this problem where, let me introduce you to two of my ancestors. This is, these are two of my Swedish uh, immigrant ancestors. They, these people were both born in Sweden. The first one is Gustav Johnson. At least this is what he was known by in the United States. And when I inherited my family's papers of pedigree charts and family group sheets, this is the information that I had on those sheets. But Johnson isn't a typical uh, Swedish uh, name, and so that site, that Nordic name site, will help me see that Johnson, uh, I, I should train myself to recognize Gustav Janusson as likely the name he would have gone by in Sweden. Uh, the woman here, Maria Karen Jansen, at least that's again how I knew her when I inherited my grandparents' papers, question I have is, you know, what's her real maiden name? Is it really Jansen? Had she already adopted her father's surname, that would have been very early for her uh, having been born in 1842 in Sweden. So my next question is maybe Jans was her, was her father's name and her real name should be Jans' daughter, a proper patronymic. Or is it something entirely different? And in this case, her real name, as she would have been known in Sweden, is Maria Kajesa Petter's daughter. Kajesa being a form of Karen, again, something that I also learned from that Nordic Names website. And her father was actually uh, Peter or Petter Jansen, and so the patronymic there makes sense. So this is a, a certainly something I have in, in my family tree, and I've seen this in quite a few other uh, researchers here in the US, US and Canada, is some of these original uh, Scandinavian names have been uh, lost, if you will. And here at MyHeritage, and a lot of the search stuff I'll be showing you today, at least on MyHeritage, we have a functionality called Global Names Translation, which will help automatically look for some of these variants, but it's important to us as users to be able to recognize uh, when we see these that these are also correct forms of these people's names. Just a quick view at the language differences between uh, these languages on the right I have English, Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, Icelandic, and Finnish. You'll notice in some cases, the words are very similar, such as son and daughter. Uh, other examples, such as girl, uh, they vary uh, significantly between each language. And then Finnish is its own linguistic, uh, linguistic family uh, member on its own with radically different names almost across the board. All right, as I mentioned, we'll now be diving into country-specific resources. We're gonna go on a broad counterclockwise motion uh, through the Scandinavian geography here from Denmark over to Norway or up to Norway, then over to Sweden and ending in Finland. I apologize, but I won't be discussing uh, Iceland or Greenland uh, in this talk. Some brief history about Denmark. Uh, really by, you know, from the Middle Ages to, uh, well, early Renaissance through 1814, Denmark and Norway was a united kingdom. 
really ruled by a, a common uh, king that often uh, sat in Copenhagen. This was known as the Oldenburg Monarchy. And the Kingdom of Denmark, so this included uh, obviously Denmark, or what we know now as, as Denmark, the Kingdom of Norway, and the Duchy of Schleswig, and the Duchy of Holstein, these two uh, provinces uh, on the north part of the mainland of Germany. From 1814 to 1905, uh, ending in 1905, Norway ceded, excuse me, Denmark ceded Norway to the King of Sweden. Uh, they did retain the Faroe Islands, Iceland and Greenland. So in, excuse me, I think that happened in 1814 and so they're uh, sort of an independent country again, uh, just mostly of what we know as Denmark. So Denmark's located on the tip of this peninsula, mostly called Jutland, and the monarchy survived until 1849 when it was transitioned to a constitutional monarchy. There's also quite a few, uh, several hundred islands uh, in the country of Denmark with Copenhagen being located on one of those. Uh, just a brief mention about this geopolitical conflict that uh, Denmark was embroiled in. It's called the Schleswig-Holstein question. So they were engaged in two wars, fighting to contain, to retain control of these duchies of Schleswig and Holstein there in the bottom. And I mention this because you're going to find in some of the Danish records that I'll be discussing today that you actually have some modern-day German uh, territories. So we have some German, uh, German content, if you will, included in some of these Denmark records because Denmark actually controlled these two territories until this uh, conflict was resolved. The flirt excuse me, the first war was resolved in 1852. This was a victory by the Danes and they retained control. Uh, here's a picture of them marching triumphantly back into Copenhagen. And then the second war occurred about 20 years later when they were defeated by the uh, Austrians and Prussians. At that point in 1864, they lost most of that territory to Germany. A funny uh, quote that I like by this former prime minister of uh, Britain who was an expert in this subject is this question is so complicated, only three men in Europe have ever understood it. One was Prince Albert. He's referring to the, the consort of Queen Victoria, who is dead. The second was a German professor who became mad, and I'm the third, and I've forgotten all about it. So if you ever do want a very interesting or uh, complicated read, uh, there's some interesting articles on Wikipedia about this, this issue. Religion in Denmark. So. We'll see this pattern really over and over again as we go through these countries, but the Evangelical Church in Denmark, also called the National Church, where the Church of Denmark was the state-sponsored church, also known as the People's Church, and it was designated as a state-sponsored church uh, even in the Constitution, the latest Constitution drafted in 1849. As of 1984, almost 92% of all Danes were members of, of that church. We owe a great deal of gratitude as genealogists to the Lutherans and their work in these countries uh, for preserving genealogical records. They just have done a marvelous job and our work would be uh, just uh, incredibly different uh, without their help. Uh, so in Denmark in 1645, all priests were required to, to keep parish records, both of birth, confirmation, marriages and burials. And then in 1814, a standardized form was adopted and priests were required to create a duplicate copy as well and send those to, the, to their administrative authority. Let's first look at some of the Denmark censuses. So national censuses in Denmark were conducted in a lot of different years. They have a very rich uh, social tradition of conducting censuses. These were all national coverage census with uh, every person being enumerated. Uh, so just a tremendous wealth of census uh, information. My Heritage and the National Archives of Denmark have had a partnership now for a few years where we have been uh, creating indexes of these census materials and publish these, publishing those on My Heritage. And I'll show you an example of those in just a moment. In the same partnership with the National Archives, those early four, as well as 1940. The 1940 census images were just released uh, a little over a year ago, and we are also within uh, about a month or two of having it finalized and ready for publication. So with what we've published already in the census uh, group here in Denmark, we have almost 33 million records with another about eight and a half coming. 
And I want to show you just an example as before we uh, get in, well, before we get into some examples, I just want to sh show you this uh, script example of this current Schrift. This is a type of old German handwriting. And one of the examples I'll show you, it's incredible to me, uh, the quality of the indexes that we have, for example, pick up this uh, cursive S and it took me a while to decipher uh, how we'd gotten the name that we had, which was correct, but uh, it certainly is one of these lowercase s's, and I'll show you that in just a moment. So with that, I'm going to switch over to a live demo. I'm going to go to Chrome, if I can find it here. There we go. So the best way to find these on MyHeritage, I'm just here on MyHeritage. I've come to the Research tab. I can find these a number of different ways. One, I could go to uh, the Denmark specific page. So if I come down here to our map and click on Denmark, I'll see our collection of records. So in this case, I want to search in the Denmark church collection that I mentioned earlier. I just need to also pull up a quick notes document. And in this case, I'm going to search for Wilhelm Polson. He was born actually on Valentine's Day. Of 1844. And he was born in this parish called Uster Uslev, if I'm saying it even close to correct. We'll go ahead and hit search. So I get a number of different records, you know, quite a quite a lot of, of results. Of, so I can start evaluating these for possibilities. I'm getting some, you know, perfect date matches. These look like very good, likely possibilities. My parish uh, matches. This one may not be him. Let's go ahead and look at this first one. So this is Wilhelm Paulsen. This is on my uh, dad's mother's side. And if I zoom in here, so let's see what it's showing me. It's saying this is a birth and baptism record. So this is an infant uh, boy, a male. Gives me the date of his baptism as well as the parish, county, and the country, and the name of the father, and the name of the mother. And one really wonderful thing about these records in the Nordic countries is women are very almost always expressed with their maiden name, and so it's it's really easy to trace women, or more easy than what we're accustomed to in uh, at least here in the U.S. and Canada, where the the maiden names of the mothers often get. Uh, lost in, in certain aspects. So let me go ahead and zoom in on the real image here and sharpen up your paleography skills because this is a this is a fairly tough record to read. And let me find the right one. Yeah, here it is. So the 14th of February, 1844, Wilhelm Polson. And then over here we see baptized on the 26th of February, 1844, and going over here to where the name of the parents are, we have Pau, P-A-U, probably U with an X, with an umlaut L, Otto Sun, and Anna Christina Rasmus' daughter. It's very common in the records that daughter was often abbreviated with a D, or sometimes you'll see a DR or a DTR. So we have a, a really nice hit here for this uh, vital record. This is you know pure gold for me as a genealogist. It doesn't get any better than this to validate or verify this uh, uh, this birth. This record gives me both the birth and the baptism. I want to also just quickly do a show you what some of the census records look like so let me come back up here to the research tab many of the censuses for Denmark you can find in this category here under Nordic census I'm gonna go ahead and show all uh, we just finished publishing the 1845 Nordic census a few weeks ago so it has a little new tag here and if I click on this one, I'm going to search for this same man, Wilhelm Polson, born in 1844. Let's put that same residence. Let's 
Oh, I'm having a hard time typing. Come on, here we go. And this will search just that specific census. Uh, there's certainly ways on the site that I can search other censuses as well, uh, all sort of together. And so here's some results. Again, I don't have the ability to say an exact birth date because the census didn't ask for that. So the second result looks to be quite, uh, quite good where I have a match on my parish and county. And if I look at this record, I can see that he's a one-year-old infant. He has two parents, the same parents that I uh, saw before in that record. And he also has a sibling here. So if I zoom in here, I can kind of scan through the document looking for people where their age is about the right age for this family. And I see them here. So here is Paul Ottos or Otson and his wife, Anna Christina Rasmus' daughter, this older uh, sibling, Luis, and Wilhelm Polson. So that's a, a great census record example. The censuses, just like you would see in any country, do evolve quite a bit. So by the time you get to, say, the 1930 census, let me just do a, a generic name here, Hans Jensen, sort of the equivalent of a John Smith here in the United States. And if we look at, let's pick this record. You see we get a double page form, both a left side and a right side, and these uh, records are spanning across the fold. I get uh, information about this uh, four member family. They're written on their own page. That's also a, a common practice in these later censuses. They were recording single families uh, oftentimes on their own schedule. I get a full birth date here, which is just uh, tremendously uh, valuable. Uh, to give not only the year of birth, but the month and day of month. So it's common in these records that the month will be uh, listed as a lower part of the fraction. So this first one here is the 27th day of September. The next one would be the 9th day of December, etc. So that's a common way that they write the month and the day of the month is in that fraction form. All right, that's a quick view at Denmark. Let's press on. Uh, just completed that task of showing you how to find some of those at my heritage. Another site that I would recommend to you is the Copenhagen Police Immigration Protocols. This is a great name index of about 400,000 Danes who immigrated between 1869 and 1908. And you'll find it there. If you search for, if you Google for Danish immigration archives, you'll, you'll, you'll certainly see this and just watch for that sort of logo that I'm showing you there. Another site that I like quite a bit is this uh, blog called My Danish Roots. It has some great uh, articles and information on things such as paleography, some of the naming practices that I mentioned, uh, deciphering vital records. So it's always great to read these blogs and I think this one is, is written by a, by a native Dane, but his English is, is just excellent. Let's move on to Norway. So one thing about Norway, if you see the map to the right, it's just a tremendously long country. If you were to put Norway or overlay it on the east coast of the United States, it would extend from uh, Florida in the south all the way up to Massachusetts in the north. As we mentioned, uh, until 1814, Norway was uh, combined with uh, into the kingdom of Norway and Denmark. And then in 1814, uh, as, as I mentioned, it was ceded to Sweden, and so it became part of the United Kingdom of Sweden and Norway. And since 1905, it's been an independent constitutional monarchy. Very similar type of, of pattern. We'll actually see this with this, the same pattern with religion in all of these countries where there's an official state church. It's the uh, Lutheran or the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, it's established by the state church, uh, as a state church, and oftentimes there's some sort of automatic uh, membership enrollment. And even today, nearly 90% of Norwegians retain official membership records. So let's look at the top tier genealogical, genealogical records in Norway. So certainly church records, census, and then some of the lower tier, which we just won't have time to talk about today. And I do apologize, this, this talk would normally, or this subject could normally be covered in an entire semester at an upper division university class. So uh, trying to squeeze this, this down to an hour is, is fun. Uh, probate uh, cemetery. So right now with Norway, one of your main websites is going to certainly be the National Archives of Norway and their digital, their digital archive. And I give you uh, 
a URL there. When you go to that site, you're going to see a whole lot of censuses, and you get kind of excited, like, man, this looks like Denmark. There's all these censuses. They have this really rich tradition. But when you read the fine print, you quickly learn that a lot of these censuses are not useful to us as genealogists. For example, these censuses in blue on the left, 1815 to 1855, were statistical only. They didn't actually record names of anybody. So not very helpful to us as genealogists. And then these next two, 1870 and 1885, these were uh, conducted only in some of the uh, commercial seaports with very few uh, people being enumerated. So if you do have a, a, a family member that lived there, those could be helpful, but generally they're not going to be of use to most genealogists. And then 1920, 1930, 1950, these haven't been released yet due to privacy laws. So we're kind of left with this situation. We have 1801, a few censuses in the 1800s, and then 1900 and 1910. So another interesting thing about Norway is uh, the index of the census indexes are not complete, uh, at least all of them. So 1801 is complete, uh, about 100% complete. 1865, that one's complete. 1875, I'm estimating just under 60% complete. 1891 is only about 20% complete. Uh, 1900 is, uh, it has a complete uh, index. And then 1910 has a complete index, but no images. So the archive decided not to actually scan the images. They created the index from their original uh, cop, their original paper materials and have not digitized the images. And then church books and parish registers. The earliest uh, church books in Norway start in uh, the early 1600s. And there were few books, there are relatively few books covering the 17th century. But from the 18th century and onwards, uh, church books are uh, well preserved from a majority of the parishes, parishes and dioceses uh, there in Norway. Many of the church books have been indexed and published by the National Archives. However, and this is their quote, not mine, only a fraction of all church books are searchable. So I, I've, have a, I've had a hard time trying to nail down an exact estimate, but I'm guessing maybe somewhere between 20 and 40% of the church books are currently searchable there at the National Archives. So finding your ancestor in a church book or parish is certainly possible. One, you can certainly try the advanced person search, and I'll show this in just a moment, and see if you get lucky and find your ancestor in some of those limited church books. Or doing it the old-fashioned way, where you're going to images almost like you would on a microfilm reader, but digitally and uh, scrolling through images and reading them really one by one. So in the church books or the parish registers, you'll find births, uh, christenings, confirmations, marriages, and deaths and burials, and a few other uh, types. There, there might be a few what are called move-in and move-out records as well. There's a huge caveat in Norway here at the National Archives, though, that I need to mention. Whoops, if we go the right direction. So virtually all of the Norwegian censuses and church indexes at the National Archives site are not what we call linked to their original images. So linked is sort of a uh, industry term that we use to indicate if the index provides the user the ability to find a record on the index and click to see the image. Uh, we refer to that as linking the index to the image, the way that these collections at uh, the Norwegian National Archive has, have evolved is they have not preserved those links. And so we have an extra level of fun in finding those original documents where we can use the indexes that are available at the National Archive site, but then we have to go to a sort of a second phase of our work to find the corresponding image for those records. So let's look uh, quickly at this example. I have uh, this uh, ancestor of mine named Andreas Petter Andreasen. He was born in 1834 in Tromsø, Norway, and he, in 1884, immigrated to the United States. Tromsø, just for information, is way up in the north of the country, clear up above the Arctic Circle. So I'm going to come over here to uh, the National Archives site. Let me get a proper URL.
there we go. So I can try the, uh, an advanced person search here. And you'll see that I can put in a name. So let's try, I'm just gonna do his given name, his first given name and his last name. Let's see, he's a male. And let's put in his birth year, 1834. And let's see what we get. So this is the way I can search all of the materials at the National Archives site, at least those that they have indexed, I should say, only their index materials. And I've done something wrong. I've misspelled Andreas. Let's try that again. There we go. So I get some some interesting hits. Some of these are are, are great hits, and they're they're wonderful. And I'll show you some of these. So here's a here's the 1865 census where my ancestor uh, is enumerated. And there's also, I believe, an 1875 census that he's in. Yeah, this one down here. I'm just scanning quickly through these others to see if I see any church books or parish registers that would look like a likely match. Unfortunately, I don't. And so I take that to mean almost for sure that those registers just aren't indexed yet. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. It just means that they're not searchable at this time. I did want to show you this uh, amazing uh, document or record for myself and my family, this 1875 census. So here's what it looks like. This is Andreas Petter Andreasen. I get some information about his gender and information about what household number he is. This is his occupation. So he's a, a fisker. This is a fisher, fisherman. So that's his occupation. I'm going to say show list. And that changes the display a little bit. I do like the table, though. What I really love about this record is it's got, I think, six of my direct ancestors in it. So this first, this old man here, Andreas Anderson born in 1795. He's the father of the first man here, Han's father, his father. And so I have one, two ancestors. Whoops, let me get back there. Then his wife, Anna Johanna, three, their son, Andreas Martin, again, one of my direct ancestors. So there's four. And then they have a lodger family here with them. This Petter Andresen and a Rebecca Andreas daughter and a Marin Johanna Petter's daughter. So Marin and Andreas Martin end up, after they immigrate to the United States, uh, finding each other and getting married. So actually a total of seven direct ancestors here on this one census uh, example. So let me come back and show you how we would try to find this uh, original record, you know, and in, in for just to save a few moments, I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to show you how to how we can find the vital record for this Andreas Petter Andresen and finding a census record would be would be similar. So let me come back here to home and I'm going to come here to explore the digital archives. There's two main branches here. I could go look for the census, and that's where I would go to find the actual census image. If I come here to church books and I scroll down, I'll find this link where I can browse the Norwegian church books. And so this is where I'm going to search for a book, but not by someone's name, but by the name of the location where the book is from. So I know it's the county of Troms, and the parish was Trom, Trondinus Parish, I believe. And I want to look for a birth register. So if I search, this is going to show me that they have one book for this parish. That's a birth register. Let me take that off, and I'll show you some others. So here's a bunch of other books for that parish. And what's what I really like about their site is they're certainly trying to help us out by giving us information about what's in each of these books. So if I were to come here to this book, I see born and baptized from 1827 to 1835. These other codes mean confirmation, marriages, deaths and burials, in and out migrations, and even a list of people vaccinated that would have been vaccine uh, against the smallpox. So let's go to the born and baptized. 
So this, this reminds me a lot of, you know, being at a library and looking at microfilm where I now get to read through these records and find uh, the record for my ancestor. In this case, I know he's on page seven. So after I've read through these pages, I may have met, I may have, mm, nope, I'm sorry, that was a different example. I'm thinking of, I'm only, I'm actually only in 1828. So the challenge with this book is you have to read a very long ways, or you can see that they're giving me some information here about the year, 1833. I'm looking for an event in 1834. And eventually, if I keep doing this and reading these records, I'll certainly find him as I have done before. It's important to, to note in a, just a quick side that a collection like this is probably ordered as the infants were being brought to the priest for, for baptism. And so it's going to primarily occur by the date of their baptism. And then secondarily, you'll find the birth date. So here you see some children born in July and then a child born in April, one in May. That's because they were presented to the priest uh, in a slightly, in a different order than, than how they were born. All right, let's jump back to our presentation. Moving on. So we looked at uh, how to find some of the records at the National Archives. Again, just a just a tremendous site. Again, there's 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 some work to do there at the National Archives uh, to improve their their indexes, get those links eventually working. But uh, I hope you don't fear it, and and you can certainly have great success. And there's nothing like doing it from the convenience of your own home. Uh, the, a blog I'd recommend you would be the Norwegian Genealogy and Then Some blog. Uh, Here's the, the URL for that, or if you Google that, I'm sure you'll find it. Again, a, a very nice uh, blog written by a, by a Norwegian covering a lot of issues uh, pertinent to genealogy and research there. Let's look at Sweden. So medieval times, uh, up to the 17th century, it was a unified kingdom, kind of zenith, or reached the max of its power in the 17th century under the influence of King, Ag King Augustus Adolphus. And by the 18th century, it was starting to lose some of its territories, including Finland in 1908. As we've mentioned, uh, from 1814 to 1905, it was unified with Norway. And from 1808, it has been a constitutional, 1809, it has been a constitutional monarchy. Very similar pattern. Uh, there's a state church. It's been the official state church even until the year 2000. And in 1972, almost 95% of Swedes belonged to the state church. So here in Sweden, we have the primary records are church books, which will contain births and baptisms, marriages or and bans or notices uh, leading up to a marriage, deaths and burials, and household examination books. And then there's also some census and population registers. There's some big news for Sweden, and really two of the I think two of the most important things in Swedish research have happened in the last uh, few months. And that's uh, the first one is here at MyHeritage. We're proud to announce that we've added the additional decades of 1860 to 1880 and 1920 to 1930 to our Sweden household examination books. I'll be showing you these records in just a moment. These are incredible records. If we had these types of records for all of the countries that we work in, our work as genealogists would be just incredibly different from what we normally do. These are just a joy to use, and I think you'll start to see that when I show those to you. So this collection has 83.7 million records. Uh, you're probably wondering, you know, how can a relatively small country support such a large collection? And that is, and you'll see this, these books often contain the same individual uh, several times. And then uh, another major announcement was just earlier this month, just what, uh, 13 days ago, uh, the National Archives of Sweden announced that they have dropped their paid access model and they've completely made their services free and open to the public. So before a yearly subscription cost a thousand kroner, that's uh, about $120 in uh, 120 US. So just a, just a great development here. And, and what I'm excited about as a person that does research in, in Sweden is these two resources work very well together uh, you'll see as I progress that uh, there aren't a lot of indexes at the National Archives site, but they do have a lot of images. 
And so I can use the index in the Sweden household examination books to help me find supporting records there at the National Archives. So highlights from the National Archives, they certainly have wonderful collections, again, mostly images of parish books. Again, these will contain births and baptisms, marriages and marriage bans, deaths and burials, and move in and move outs. They also have census. And when you look at the census uh, registers or records in Sweden, uh, there's this chart that I downloaded from their site earlier this week showing you the coverage. So basically they have good coverage for the 1880, 1890, 1900, 1910. The 1860 census was only conducted for one county or lawn, and the 1870 census was only conducted for two. The 1930 census is being transcribed and released as we speak, but uh, it's also under a 100-year privacy ban where they're only releasing records for persons who would be older than 100 years. So basically we have four complete national censuses there in Sweden that we can access at the National Archives site. Across these uh, resources, there's uh, 21 million records. And there's a, there's a link to that site. And I'll show you a little bit about uh, the National Archives site in just a moment. But first let's look at uh, a more in-depth study of the household examination books. This is, a, this is the Swedish word for these books. I'm not gonna try to say it because I, I know I won't do it properly. They're also called household examination records or clerical surveys, and sometimes you'll also see them referred to as church census or church censuses. These household examination books are like a census in many ways. We, we in some of our uh, publication on MyHeritage, we do classify them as a census because they, in some ways, are similar. They have names of family members, and you look, you learn about family groups and residences and how people are related to each other, and you get information on their ages and you often get occupation information. Uh, a census, though, is specific to certain enumeration dates where that's one key difference in these household examination books. These are really a play-by-play -play tracking of the family. So these Lutheran ministers acting really as government agents, right? They were part of the state church. In a way, they were performing a role of what we would consider to be a civil registrar, that they were going to every... Uh, family in their in their parish and recording the changes that had occurred to the family almost on a yearly or every six month type of basis. So we get full and rich vital events with year, month, and day of month for births, marriages, and deaths, as well as uh, tremendous information about who's moving, who's leaving the family, who's coming back. Uh, this project that we have done is was in a collaboration with a wonderful company in Sweden that I, I would recommend you investigate called Archive Digital. They have a great website of, of very high quality uh, scans that they've taken of not only these household examination books but other materials there in Sweden. This is what one of the books looks like. Uh, there's over 40,000 of these books in this collection. So this is for the year 1891 to 1895 for this uh, parish that, again, I won't try to pronounce. Here's what these books look like, and I'll, I'll dive into a little uh, more detailed example in just a moment. And if we look closely, what we'll see is we get the person's name, uh, position, occupation, and trade in the left column here. We also get their day, or we, we get their birth, we get information about their year of birth as well as their month and day of month of birth and their birthplace. We get information about their marriage. Often it's a marriage date, not just an indication of a you know yes or no or, or something like that. And we also get information about where they moved in from. So in this particular example, uh, over here on the right near the bottom right corner, you can see this number 59. That says that this family moved in from this parish on pa from page 59 to this page. So we can track families through uh, time and location with these records, and I'll show you an example in just a few moments. We also get information about their death. So this particular example shows two deaths in the very rightmost column there. Again, so the year would be 1876, this top one, the month, or the day of month, excuse me, or no, I'm sorry, that's the day of month is the 4th of December. 
If we look at the right side of this page, the rightmost columns, we also get information about where they moved out. Some of these other columns to the left on this example are things about their knowledge of the catechism that they were testing up until the late 1800s, as well as information about their literacy. Uh, at one point they had a column, I think, indicating uh, information about uh, vaccinations that they'd received um, specifically for the smallpox. So coming back to the Swedish couple that I introduced earlier, so just an amazing example from my own research. So here I find them in, in this book and I see over here where they moved out on the right that they left to America on 1879 on the 11th of June. So these are, are wonderful resources uh, and amazing what you can find. It also says here that they were Mormon. Uh, these were some of my LDS uh, converts that were coming here to Utah. And before we dive into these a little bit uh, with a, a quick demo, I did wanna briefly mention some of the provinces and county changes that have happened in Sweden. So uh, almost anciently to us until 1634, there were provinces, uh, the, or the country of Sweden was broken up into the provinces as I show. And from 1634 forward, there were counties and some of them are significantly different. You see, especially down in the South where the counties are often uh, uh, structured differently than they were as provinces. And then in the last 20 to 30 years, additional changes have continued to happen, where for example, some of my Swedish ancestors are from Malmo, this county way at the bottom. And you'll look on the right-hand side, you see that Malmo or Malmos doesn't exist anymore. And that's because it was combined with the county of Kristianstad and is now known as Skane County. So whenever you're looking at Swedish records, and I've, I've tripped up on this and just wanna help you not make the same mistakes I've done, is think about what the county list is. Are they showing you a list of modern counties like I'm showing here on the right? Or are they sort of the historical counties in the middle? Or are they even these older provinces that I have on the left? This will help you sort of navigate and decipher records. So let's do a let's do a demo here. So I'm going to flip over to Chrome. I'm going to come to my heritage. I'm going to come to the research tab and show you where this incredible collection is. We're going to go to Nordic Census, and I'm going to click here on Sweden household examination books. So in this example, I'm going to use I picked Anders. Gustav, everyone's named Anders, it seems, right? Anderson. And like my other ancestor, this man, as I picked this date and found this example, was born on Valentine's Day, but in the year 1833. So let's see what we can find for this gentleman. So we get a lot of results. So Gustav, Anders Gustav Andersson, the names are looking uh, spot on, but I'm gonna start to sort of filter these in my mind. And one thing I'm looking for is uh, where I know this person lived. And this parish, this Hova parish, is certainly a place that I'm familiar with for this family. As is this uh, Algaros. So let's go look at this first example. And an important distinction here that I want you to, to notice is we're listing the book here. And so this is the parish, and this is an archival indicator of the fourth volume. And this is the year range that this book covers. So this book will have this family in it potentially more than once. In fact, if we look at these two records, this record and this record, you'll see that they're from the same book. So I wanna look at this one first. Yep, and what I see is I, is I have uh, this person I'm looking for, Anders Gustav Andersson. I get his birth date. This is a, some sort of farm name, most likely, of where he was born. And I get information about his residence. And we're also, we also learn his marriage date. If I look at this record, if I blow it up, I get a fairly complicated view. And let me go to a better screen here. And your first question is, why are they stricken out? 
And what the practice was that the Lutheran ministers did is when the family moved, well, a person is stricken out for two reasons. One, they either died or two, they moved. So we see on the second line here, this woman. So here's a Hustra, Stina Jan's daughter. Over here in the death column, we see that she died in 1874. So the priest would have stricken her out. We also see that Anders Gustav, Gustav Anderson becomes a widow on the day of her wife's death, which we get a full, probably the full death date is listed here. The other thing that we learn is this family, well, we learn a number of things, but this family moves to page 302. This was the example I showed briefly earlier when I was showing the header. So as we start to dissect this record, we can discover some very interesting things about this family. So uh, Anders' wife, Stina, passes away in 1874. And then above Stina, Jan's daughter, the priest writes this new woman, Carolina Anders' daughter, who moves in in 18, I'm sorry, she's born in 1847. She moved from this uh, parish called Hova in 1874, and they were married in on the 28th of November, 1874. So we have record of two marriages here, Anders with his first wife, Stina, and then Anders with his second wife, uh, Carolina Anders' daughter. So another thing, and then we also see a number of children here. So I want to jump over to page 302. So one thing we built in this collection is this nice page jumper. So I'm going to go to page 302, which is actually image 309 in the book, but we want to look at page 302. If I come here to 302, I will see the same family, Anders Gustav Anderson, with wife number two, who has passed away again. So he's had uh, his first wife pass away, and now his second wife has passed away in 1878. And one thing I find interesting here is if you look uh, here at one of the sons, so look at the son on line seven, Johann Fritz, or the second half of line seven, you'll see that he was born on the 30th of August, 1878, and Anders' second wife passed away just, what, five days later. So probably some pretty good evidence that she probably died due to complications of childbirth and, again, left Anders a widow. Another uh, woman moves in in 1879, moves in, and yes, in 1879, and they are married uh, as well. So this is a, a quick example of, of these records and how you can use them to find families. In the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to illustrate how to go to the National Archives site and, and find the vital records for these collections, but it's a very similar pattern to what I showed for uh, Norway and and Denmark. So let me jump back to our presentation. These household records, I, I often feel like this, where I'm just getting an information dump. As genealogists, I, I feel like we're, we spend a lot of time trying to find records and, and finding new records with these household examination books. They just come screaming at you because they're, they're so uh, easy and, and quick to find. The, the dates that I, that I showed that you in those records, uh, such as their birth dates, death dates and marriage dates I found to be very reliable. They're recorded consistently. They're often exactly, uh, at least in my experience, what the vital record, the, the church vital records show. So just a tremendous uh, resource there for Sweden. Let's look briefly at Finland. Uh, again, Finland's a, a very, uh, fairly lar long country. Uh, history similar to what we've seen in some of the other uh, Scandinavian countries. Uh, sort of being in control by some of their neighbors, such as Sweden, or in this case, Russia in Finland. And in 1918, they did have a Finnish civil war where they became uh, fully independent. And since then, they've been the Republic of Finland. Similar pattern with religion, a state-sponsored church. In 1900, 98% of the population were members. It's dropped quite a bit since then, but in 2013, still 75% of Finns were members, and again, we owe, a, we owe a great deal of gratitude to these ministers. As I kind of hinted at earlier, Finnish and Swedish are both the official languages, and church records were widely kept in, in Swedish until the late 1800s. 
the genealogical records in Finland are primarily church, church, and more church. Uh, history books, or what we'd probably call a parish register, and main and confirmation books. And then there are some second and third tier, which we won't look at, census and tax lists, immigration, etc. So the history books, these are uh, books or records of births, marriages, and deaths. One site I'm going to recommend that you investigate for accessing an index to, to these births, marriages, and deaths. Again, it's not a complete index, but it's quite good, is Hiskey. So the Hiskey database doesn't contain all the parishes in Finland, but new parishes are added. And there's also an up-to-date transcription status on the site. So when you go to Hiskey, you'll see a map like this. So I'll select the parish that I'm interested in, this Liljindel. And I'm presented with a form, a number of different forms. This one I chose a christening. And here on the, on the Hiskey site, I can enter the name. So I'm entering the first name, Johan Tornblom and doing a search, and I get a record of four children that were christened where he was listed as the father. If we had more time, I'd be able to show you how you can follow these tiny little magnifying glass icons to actually go find the original records or the, the scans of the records for these documents. And I'm presenting those here. These can be a uh, paleography challenge again, but with practice you can, I think, very easily learn to decipher these. So these are these, uh, the records for these four christenings of these four children. So in the Swedish section we talked about the Swedish household examination books. These main and confirmation books are very similar in many ways to what, we sh to what I showed you for Sweden. They were done again by the Lutheran ministers during a time when uh, Finland was heavily uh, influenced by Sweden. There are some important differences though. And let me show you some screenshots instead of the live, live demo. So on my heritage, you can come to the collection. Let me just show you where that is. So if I come back to the research tab, again, we classified this as a Nordic census. We have these Finland church census and pre-confirmation books with over 33 million records in it. So this is gonna have a very similar type of fill as the Swedish, Swedish collection that I just showed you. And here's an example. They are a little bit different. This is a, an earlier example also, where, uh, for example, down here near the bottom, I found this person I've been looking for, Kaseya Lisa Samuel's daughter. And her family is everyone listed her above, uh, above her. So her father there at the top is Samuel Matson. And then I can also find her husband, or before they were married, Johann Carlson Tornbohm. This is the same uh, couple that I showed you just briefly in the Hiskey example. So this person is listed third on this document there. He's listed as a son, Johann Carlson Tornbohm, born on the 7th of August, 1828. And then here's the record of where they exist as a couple both with their birth dates. And one question that you might have is, might have is where are their children? What important, one important distinction for these records is the children until they were confirmed at about the age of 15 were kept in a separate register called the children's book. Or in Finnish, a listen kirat, or in Swedish, the barn booker or barn book. And as I said, most confirmations occurred at about the age of 15. And we've included these uh, children's books into the same collection. So with some searching, I can find this amazing record for this, this couple. So this is uh, Johan Tornbohm and Kaseya. And they have, uh, what, 10 children here? One, two, three, four, five. All but two of whom have passed away. So just a very large infant mortality rate in this family. You can see the death dates over on the right where uh, the first one, for example, says, it's weird how they've written, not weird, but not uncommon, that this person died on the 4th of July in the year 1854. Actually, their first two children died on the same day. I wonder if there was a disease or something that gone that swept through the family. So just in conclusion, we're really entering a golden age of Nordic genealogy. Uh, with the tools that are online and the robust collections, both indexes and images, 
Uh, it's easier to find uh, our family and ancestors like never before. More collections are being published uh, each year. And the good news, uh, I think one of the also uh, most important aspects as we've seen in this uh, announcement just a couple weeks from the National Archives of Sweden is archives are moving more and more towards collaboration and open data models, which are very helpful to us as genealogists. So with that, I'm going to kick it back over to Jeff for some Q&A. Again, my name is Mike Mansfield. There's my email address. I'd be happy to hear from you uh, later. And thank you. I think Jeff's taken over. Yeah, thanks, there, Mike. Jeff? Thank you very much. Hey, by the way, Kurt writes in saying, absolutely the most informative webinar I have ever watched. And I know I, I know Kurt's been to lots of them, so Kurt, glad that you enjoyed it here today. Mike, my, uh, my favorite records of all time are those Swedish household records. Those are incredible. It, I, I wish every country everywhere had those kind of records. Nice to know that my heritage has those. Yeah, names. we'd be spoiled if that was the case, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're amazing. Well, hey, let's uh, let's just look at our upcoming live webinars as part of the My Heritage webinar series, and then we'll uh, conclude with questions. Uh, so next Wednesday on the 21st of February uh, is Tribal Quest, a special project to document the family histories of tribal people. I've I've uh, seen the entire uh, class now. I I, uh, I reviewed it yesterday, and it is it's absolutely incredible. Uh, you're going to love it. Uh, coming up on March 13th, we'll have true stories of families reunited thanks to genetic genealogy. Then we'll have hands-on with my heritage DNA. Uh, followed by how DNA testing can reveal your ethnic roots, and then genealogy for advanced users, grow your family tree online. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you uh, there. Uh, let's do a couple of door prizes. So we've got a, uh, a one-year MyHeritage data subscription, and uh, Mike, with the various records that you were showing us today, um, they're they're included in the in either the data subscription or the complete subscription up at my heritage is that accurate yeah that's correct so all the danish materials all those still to be published as, the, as well as the swedish and finnish content okay there. oh very good okay who wants a who wants a one year data subscription go ahead and find that hand raising button janet's just asking how do i tell if my hands raised well i've now turned on your ability to raise your hand uh and we'll take Oh, I don't know. Well, uh, we're gonna. Well, we're gonna. I know we're gonna do two of these door prizes. Let's take. Uh, I'm gonna take number. Let's do number two and number two hundred. How about that? All right. First, I'm gonna write down your name. First, we have Ruth Stangs. Ruth, congratulations. Thanks for being number two. Let me move on to my second slide. Here we are. And let me go find number two hundred. Just take me a little bit longer. Right here, Ron Fisher. Ron, congratulations. Writing down your name. So just watch for an email from us uh, probably uh, sometime later on today. Okay, well, uh, congrats. And by the way, uh, with uh, tomorrow being Valentine's Day, uh, I just noticed earlier today, and let me pull this up, up at blog.myheritage.com, that love is in the air. Free Valentine's Day access to all marriage records on MyHeritage. Uh, no subscription is required, and this is good through Thursday evening, so do check that out. And a uh, good sale on uh, MyHeritage DNA test. Okay, let's go to this slide now, and let's, uh, let's go with some questions. Oh, Ruth writes saying, wow, thank you. Never won anything before. Yeah, congrats, Ruth. Uh, okay, so let's let's do this one from Gene to start. Although my, I think Mike, I think he just, I think Mike just answered this. Uh, Gene says, "Do you have to have a full membership to use that research tab uh, in My Heritage? And are there any any specials on on My Heritage uh, either now or coming up? Do do we do those every once in a while, Mike?" Yeah, I. Uh, sorry, I'm not plugged into our promotional calendar. Uh, 
Yeah, but the content's there on the research tab. You can also go to the, the research tab. If you look at the footer of our web of our site, even if you're not logged in, okay. you can get to that research tab without having to put in any username or password. And it will show you lots of records in kind of what we call a veil mode. So you can get a fill for the types of results you would get. So if Jeff were to log out here. Oh, if I log out. Okay, let me do that then. No, we just pretend you're a completely new user or yeah. something. Okay, I'm logging out. You could go to the bottom there, and in the under the home sort of column there in the footer, it says historical records. Okay. Here you go. Sorry, I realized my microphone wasn't properly positioned. Oh, thanks, that sounds so, good. So at this point, we don't know anything about Jeff or, or who he is, but he can still do global searches. He can go to specific collections, and you can get a feel for what the service uh, will provide. Good. So this is certainly a, a kind of a way to see, you know, do they even have my really – unique name in, in the database or something like that. And Mike, I'm looking up here. Uh, since yesterday, we were when we were at 8.4 million, we're now at 8.5 million, it looks like. So uh, nice job. Keep, keep them coming. I think you mean billion. Uh, right? Billion. Yeah. Did I say million? Yeah, uh, 8.5 billion. There's a big difference there. <laughs> Thanks for that clarification. No problem. <laughs> uh, wondering, this is uh, Via, is wondering uh, if... There's Baltic country records up at MyHeritage, like Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, um, similar to these collections you've taught us about today, or in the future uh, we, plans. We have a few uh, collections from the Baltic countries. Okay. The records in those countries are, are actually amazing. Uh, Estonia has some wonderful records. I, I've seen them before. Yeah. It's it, it's a hard market for us to prioritize at the time we we have yeah. lots of fish we want to catch and fry <laughs> uh, not that we don't like Estonia but uh, yeah we're, we're constantly having to make decisions about you know where we go and 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 where we spend uh, certainly yeah. our limited budgets on yeah, so makes sense I'm certainly holding out hope that Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania will will get their day in the Sun uh, okay. soon okay well thanks Mike for that. The farm books, I think you briefly mentioned those. Judy's wondering, and for Norway, uh, available online or in a, in a library? What's the best way to access those? Yeah, it's been a while since I've, since I've looked for farm books. Okay. Uh, I do have a copy of one for one of my Norwegian families. It's all in Norwegian. I, I need to get it professionally translated. Uh, I yeah, I, I can't give too much insight into the availability of yeah, farm books. Okay. I think I have seen some sites that do uh, provide some sort of listings to where you might be able to find some of them. But I think in many cases they're still fairly limited. But okay. uh, I'm certainly not as expert on that as, as I probably would like to be. Okay. It, Mike, when I, I remember uh, when I f was a beginner genealogist, uh, I found the farm books at the, oh, what, basement floor two at the Family History Library, and, and they're incredible. They're incredible, uh, and so yeah, that'd be that'd be really neat to have them uh, find them online sometime. Um, what about Shirley, who's wondering? Well, her specific question is, how do I find the parish to search for records? So, what do we do if we um, we know we have an ancestor in these countries, but we're we only know the country level? Uh, how do we how how do we start to identify? Uh, what parish they may have been been uh, from. Yeah, so certainly identifying this is a challenge not only in Scandinavia and Finland, but also in other countries like Ireland, where it's, it, it's one of the most important aspects is knowing where your ancestor was from. So the good news is with a lot of these resources I talked about today, you now have some nationwide indexes where you'll have a chance to find them. Now, if you're dealing with a fairly common name, you need to think about how you can add information to your search so that you disambiguate your results. So if your ancestor, heaven forbid, were named something like John Smith, you know, you're going to have just untold numbers of results you'll have to look for. But what will help you is if you know your ancestor was John Smith and his wife was Martha and they had a son... William and a daughter Elizabeth putting all that information into a search form such as we have on MyHeritage will help you uh, 
greatly winnow down those results that you need to you need to look at and also help you identify the proper family you're kind of looking for the this entire thumbprint almost of the family uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a context you can know that you have the right individuals by who they're related to you know same thing with with maybe their parents uh, anything else that you have from the family uh, it's certainly important and try to put that into the search. Very good. Thanks, Mike. A question from Jean. Uh, Jean says, I ran into a problem in Sweden locating my great-grandfather's grave. Uh, the cemetery records there said he was buried there, oh, back in 1916, but she didn't find a, a gravestone. And then she heard about this 50-year rule on maintaining graves and that Swedish cemeteries may actually remove the remains. And Jean's wondering, is this a common practice and and if so uh, how would I locate more uh, exact information yeah so I have seen this practice with cemeteries not only in Sweden but also Finland and uh, even in Australia where it seems like the practice is by by default you can lease uh, the plot for a certain number of decades like in Australia I think uh, the default is 20 you can go as much as 50 if you if you'd like and then at the end of that time frame, they will reuse uh, the plot. Uh, your your best option in Sweden, though, really is to look at those uh, church uh, church records there at the National Archives, as well as if you said he was buried in nineteen, if he died in nineteen sixteen, this collection that I that I mentioned, he should be in there a number of times actually in our Swedish household examination books. So if you can identify a Identify the, pers the person, you should be able to see his death date, and then you can also corro uh, corroborate that with the church records there at the National Archives. Okay. Uh, yeah, but finding an actual burial might be might be a little tough, or, or a headstone. Oftentimes the, the, the death records, or the church death records, will include the date of burial. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. And by the way, Matt, uh, both Matt and Terry are writing in saying uh, that uh, Germany also has a similar practice related to cemeteries and burial. Uh, I remember learning that from some of our previous uh, webinars on Germany. And then Karen, uh, let me answer your question who asks, is this presentation going to be available later on? Uh, yeah, it'll be uh, up in the webinar library at familytreewebinars.com a little bit later on this afternoon. Julie writes in saying Mexico also does this with cemeteries. Um, and, oh, and Jean writes back, so thanks for your response. Mike, she says uh, she's searched those records. Those burial records are hard to find. This is a great webinar loaded with information. So, uh, Jean, thanks for being oh, here. Oh, thank you. Uh, so Carla's wondering <clears throat> about patronymics. Uh, she says it just seems to be a big problem with so many men, so many people carrying the same names. Uh, how is is that a a brick wall um, creator, or is is patron is patronymics? Is that something we can overcome? Uh, your thoughts on patronymics to the researcher? Yeah, so it certainly is a is a common question that 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 you see in Nordic research. Because as as I think she she recognized, you know, there's just a handful of common names that both the men and the women or given names will be will be known by. So again, it's it's kind of coming back to looking at the individual within as much context as you can get. Uh, if you know who their sibling is, if you know who their father or mother are, who their wife is, knowing you know again if your ancestor is. Anders Anderson, but if it's an Anders Anderson married to a Marin Karl's daughter who had a son, Johan Nilsson, or, you know, Johan Anderson, all those aspects will greatly reduce the number of, of, of results you need to look for, but also give you confidence that you have the right person because they're fitting into the family that you know. So you kind of need to think in a, almost like, I got to find the family. How can I find the family? And if you look at the search templates we have on MyHeritage and a lot of sites, you can put in additional relatives. And that's a very powerful technique. So sometimes I'll just, you know, I, I want to find children of a, of, a, of a couple. So I'll put in just the mother and father's name and leave the primary uh, names uh, empty and see what I can get. Hmm, interesting. So, 
Yeah, think think family and anything you have about their context uh, will be helpful. Okay, thanks, Mike. Just a few minutes to go here. A question from Karen, who's asking about uh, ship sealing records out of Copenhagen. Uh, maybe that's beyond the scope of, of what we're doing here today, but uh, are there records available? So I did mention... Uh, one nice site uh, in my Denmark section that that'll be in the presentation again. This, these Copenhagen police oh, immigration right. protocols, yeah. those started in I think was it 1868. Uh, about 400,000 uh, Danes sailing from Copenhagen are are in that database. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that reminder. Um, is that up on the? Is it the DDD site? You can get a link to it if you do go through that, uh, just okay. referring to this Donks demographic database. Uh, you, you'll also see that at the National Archives. Uh, it's sort of a loose, it's, it's just a separate organization that they, they're referring people to. Yeah, okay. Now, what about this from Joyce? Uh, the Finnish records from the early 1800s, or would they be kept in Finland or in Russia? Or do we need to further investigate that? <laughs> So, yeah, one thing I didn't have time to talk about in my whirlwind <laughs> talk was the lost, uh, the lost Karelia, if I'm saying it right, or the lost lands of, of, of Finland. So on the eastern uh, side of Finland, or what's now in Russia, there were uh, quite a few Finnish communities that had historically been considered part of Finland, and they were uh, kept by the by by Russians before or during the 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 final conflicts there that, that resolved uh, Finland's independence, I believe that they're with Russia. That the Las Karelia are in Russian archives. Uh, I did have one conversation with the the archivist there at the National Archives of Finland, where he said that they've been on a long process to try to get some of those records repatriated, but those are often long mm -hmm. and challenging processes that only uh, sometimes actually work so okay yeah buried in russia would be my would be my first guess okay thanks mike or, well we've got a minute to go here uh can you can you talk just for a bit about uh any new major collections that uh have been published up at my heritage recently and and uh where would i go to find out what's what's been added yeah and and i would uh I definitely mentioned what I think Jeff already has is the blog at MyHeritage. So blog.myheritage.com is one of the best sources of information for okay. content releases that we do. Uh, almost For almost every major content release that we do, there'll be a, a blog article shortly uh, after the release. Okay. Uh, some, of the, some of the largest things that we've recently done, again, this ongoing work we're doing in Denmark, right before the new year, we released a just huge collection of U.S. school yearbooks. So those are super fun to see uh, yearbook images, mostly for what I call the, you know, what we'd call the baby boomer generation is where that collection is particularly strong, almost a quarter of a million uh, yearbooks uh, just in that one collection. I'm wondering. Uh, this, this, other, the, the, this other collection of Denmark church records is one that we've been working on for a, a long time and are excited to get it out and, and finalized. Oh, good. So I'm wondering, uh, can I sort? I, I probably can. Can I sort this? By, oh, right here. Yeah. Sort so, by right. The yeah. Last so Jeff's updated. showing us the the collection catalog, and if he goes to last updated. Okay. So at the top here, we have some of the, the some major. sort of prom promoted ones, but uh, also updated. So the Sweden collection that I mentioned that we recently updated, the yearbooks that I just mentioned. Yeah. In October, we did a, a nice update to the New York passenger list. Now, Mike, I wouldn't call it nice. I'd call it, I'd call it awesome. re revolutionary. Totally awesome. Yeah. Oh, that was. There huge. you go. We did a. Well, I I could say that because we did a webinar on that uh, a couple of months ago, and and we learned all about that. Great. Well, uh, Mike, we're gonna say goodbye and thanks to everybody. Uh, any final thoughts you want to conclude with here, Mike? No, thank you for your time. Uh, using some of these non-English sites and collections can be a bit daunting, but again, just with some practice and perseverance, I, I think you can 
do great things. So good luck, everybody. Okay, very good. Thanks, Mike, uh, and thanks to all of you, wherever and whenever you are around the world, for sharing part of your day with us. And remember, life is short. Do genealogy first. Bye, everyone. Bye, Mike. Goodbye. Goodbye.